Yeah. Ernie! Ernie's in the house! How are you doing? Good to see you. I don't even care. Good to see you, man. Obadiah. All right, let's get rolling here this morning. Amos, chapter 5. We're going to pick back up after our... You got a little break last week. You got to learn something new. And Tommy did a whole book, I hear. Yeah, isn't that something? Here we are just on chapter 5 after all these weeks of hearing me drone on and on. And Tommy comes in here and covers a whole book. Yeah, well, I guess that's, yeah. <laughs> but I know Brother Calvin would have stepped in. You would have stepped in if, ne if needed, right? If we had. Maybe not me, but. We would have figured it out, huh? <laughs> All right, we're going to keep on going. Amos chapter 5. We will likely not get through the entire chapter this morning, but I did want to, to thank Tommy for stepping in last week. That was very nice of him. We were up in the, the country doing a little bit of work, so thank you, Tommy. You can thank Tommy for us. <laughs> All right, before we get into chapter 5, let's pray. Father, we're grateful this morning, Lord. We're grateful for a wonderful men's retreat that we just came through. Father, we pray that you would continue to strengthen the hearts of the men in our church and in our community. We thank you, Lord, for the, the opportunity that we had yesterday to get to know one another more and to get to know you more and to have the opportunity just to, to help each other get closer to you, Father. So we pray that the seeds that were planted yesterday would, would grow. We thank you so much, Lord, for that time. We pray for this morning, Lord, that you would bless this season of opening the Word together, Father. We just thank you that we can do this. I thank you for each and every person that is here this morning and their contribution to your work in the kingdom and for their their hunger for your word, Lord, that they would prioritize being here to hear what you would have them hear. We pray that you would speak truth this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So if you remember, we, we looked at the grammatical structure of the book of the overarching book of Amos early on, and we talked about how in English, a lot of times, the very first sentence of a paragraph will be the, the most important, and then we support that theme for the rest of the paragraph, whereas many times in, in Hebrew literature, they build to a peak, and then they come back down off of that peak. And we're going to see that in our text this morning as we look at Amos 5, 1 through 17. This is Amos, so we've got to start off with a lamentation. But then we actually, we get into something a little bit unique in Amos. This is the only chapter where we actually have a call to repentance. But then again, condemnation. This is Amos. Build into a peak, a doxology, a hymn of praise to God. And then we walk back down the mountain with condemnation, another call to repentance, and we wrap up the, this section with another lamentation. So it's just interesting to see the, the diversity in, in how the Lord structured this book. So as we, as we get into chapter 5, let's, read, let's start off with just reading this first lamentation, verses 1 through 3. Hear this word that I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel, Fallen, no more to rise, is the virgin Israel, forsaken on her land, with none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, The city that went out a thousand shall have a hundred left. That which went out a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. So, good morning, Jew. Look at you walking so well. He's walking so well. That's so good. Recovery is going well, it looks like. That's, 
So it's interesting here that there's the man of the hour. We were just thanking you. We're not going to thank you again because Sharon's going to let you know that we thanked I've got, you already. I've, 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 I've got Ben and we can send you. You should have heard what he was saying about you before you came in. All I'm good sure, things. I'm sure it's something you haven't read in <laughs> All right, so this lamentation, it's interesting that, that we're shifting a little bit to this future tense. Amos is talking as though this has already happened, and it's like it's got these, these tones of a funeral dirge almost, uh, that you know nobody's coming to help. There's none to raise her up. When God moves in judgment, there's, there's really none to rescue. And the, the emphasis here... As we see many times in prophetic scripture, the emphasis is many times on the remnant that will return. Because there's hope for the future, there's hope for, for the remnant. But, but in this case, that's really not the emphasis when we, we read in verse 3. What's the emphasis? It's not the returning remnant, but it's the staggering losses. 90% dead and captured. 90%. A thousand will go out, you'll have a hundred left. Hundred will go out. You'll have ten left. So, so these these staggering losses. We're almost reminded of when we were reading in chapter three, verse twelve, when Amos said, "As the shepherd rescues from the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, you know, just this little this little bit is all that's left." And the the emphasis is on goodness. Look at all that we've lost. But even so, it's not a complete destruction, right? It's not a complete destruction. We're going to take a little bit of an aside here and talk about the. We'll talk about these losses, the ten lost tribes of Israel. Let's talk about these ten lost tribes. Amos is prophesying about this coming Assyrian invasion, after which the majority of the people in the land have been exported out of the land, deported, assimilated into other cultures, and then other conquered people have been brought in to the land. So there were Jews that were left in the land that had ended up intermarrying with those countries that were imported from the Assyrians. But this idea of the lost ten tribes is somewhat based on assumption rather than the teaching of Scripture. So, for one, many righteous Israelites had moved south. And we're going to read a couple of passages here to, to support that claim. When the kingdom split after King Solomon's time, there was a division with the ten tribes to the north, Judah and Benjamin to the south, but let's see what happened when some of these righteous members of that northern kingdom were vexed with what was happening in their political and religious climate. In 2 Chronicles 11, 14 through 16, For the Levites left their common lands and their holdings and came to Judah and Jerusalem, because Jeroboam and his sons cast them out from serving as priests of the Lord. And he appointed his own priests for the high places, for the goat idols and the calves that he had made. And those who had set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel came after them from all the tribes of Israel to Jerusalem to sacrifice to the Lord, the God of their fathers. So as we talked about that first week of Amos, there's always, there's always a remnant, right, Shirley? always a remnant that's been faithful to the Lord. And many of those faithful Israelites had moved <coughs> south. And, and this passage that we just read, that was fairly recent. That was after Jeroboam II, who is a contemporary of the time that we're in, had created those calves in Dan and Beersheba. But even if we back up further than that, in 2 Chronicles 15.9, this is speaking of King Asa's reform. So this was very shortly after Rehoboam. So Rehoboam was the, the king of the southern kingdom. Remember, Jeroboam I was a king of the, 
the northern kingdoms. And even in that time, we see in 2 Chronicles 15, 9, And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin, and those from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon, who were residing with them, for great numbers had deserted to him from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. So, so the righteous had seen something, something special is continuing to go on down there in the southern kingdom. We're going we're gonna to go down there. But let's, let's look and see if there's any evidence that maybe these ten tribes aren't as lost. We're going to do a little bit of a sword drill this morning. So who wants to read Luke chapter 2, verse 36? Luke 2, 36. All right, Brother Tommy's got that one. Somebody else? I tell you what, Tommy's going to get double duty. He's going to get Luke 1, 5 also. So be prepared to turn back a chapter. All right, somebody look up Romans 11, verse 1. Who's got that one? All right, Sister Ann's got Romans 11, 1. Then we need a Luke 22, 30. All right, thank you, sister. All right, let's go with that for right now. So, Tommy, what does Luke 2.36 say? There's a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. All right, so here we have this prophetess, Anna, of the tribe of Asher. So She hadn't forgotten. Asher wasn't lost, right? And then if you read Luke 1, 5, Tommy, what does that say? In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abishai, and he had a wife from the daughters of Herod. Uh, uh, All right, so we have this priest, Zechariah, division of Abijah, and then daughters. So these were Levites, right? Daughters of Aaron. So they hadn't forgotten who they were. Romans 11, 1. All right, well, look at that. So Paul knew. Paul knew where his roots were in the tribe of Benjamin. So those are specific examples of people that trace their lineage back to, to tribes that were not Judah. Now, Benjamin, obviously, was a member of the southern tribe, so you could make an argument, but they had a little bit of judgment coming to them as well here in the future as, uh, during the Babylonian deportation. But Jesus didn't tell his disciples they judged the remaining two tribes. What, what, what did Jesus say there, Sister Eunice? They to eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and to sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. All twelve tribes. Look at that. So Jesus acted like there were twelve tribes. Paul and James spoke in the future of twelve tribes in Acts 26. When Paul's making his defense, I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And then James, the same thing, starts off his book with James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. And then, if you remember, when Brother Marcel was walking us through Revelation, we talked about the the, the tribes that are listed in Revelation 7, 5 through 8. And it's, that's an interesting mix because Dan is not listed in that list. Joseph and Ephraim are both, or Joseph and Manasseh actually are both listed, but there's, there's no Dan. But the, I guess the, the idea here is that God is keeping track of what's going on. So this idea of the ten lost tribes, where'd that even come from then? If we've got these scriptural references that show that clearly after the Assyrian invasion, these tribes were maintaining their identity. And it get, we're not going to have time to get into the, the whole idea of replacement theology, but replacement theology is the idea that, that modern Christians or, or some other group have replaced Israel and all the promises that God made to Israel as God's chosen people. Two sons, uh, Simeon. For their harshness, their uh, yeah. That was uh, Jacob. Did that, Abraham. Jacob. 
I don't remember. And I was, when you were talking about replacement, that's why I think I thought Joseph's two children took their place. And they do in many lists. Uh -huh. Ephraim and Manasseh do replace. It's just interesting when you get to Revelation that they list that Joseph and Manasseh are listed. So does anybody remember the story that Sister Anne? I'm drawing a little bit of a blank on that one, but She's talking about when, um, when, it, when uh, Jacob blessed Ephraim and Manasseh. I thought you were. Is that is that what you're referring to when he crossed his hands? You mean? Oh, okay. No, 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 no. This was, I think, when he was dying and he was blessing the different tribes. Well, they didn't all get a blessing. You're right. Yeah, that was... But, but when he got to Simeon and Levi, I think it was. I, I can't remember. I don't remember because Levi in that list. But it was two of them. Simeon and Levi. Oh, she's talking about it in uh, Genesis 50. When he was yeah, yeah, when we're... Dying. When we're... When we're Speaking the blessings on some, but the not so blessings on others. Yeah, they were ruthless, basically. Yeah. Let's just make sure. In Genesis. Okay, here we go. Genesis 49, 5. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul not come into their counsel. O oh, my glory, be not joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men, and in their willfulness they hamstrung oxen. So yeah, they certainly, they did not get a blessing in that, in that case. But it's interesting that, you know, their, their lines remain, whereas Dan... In verse 16, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider falls backwards. So yeah, there, it, that, that concept in Old Testament literature and, and history of the father blessing the son, we would be well to, to revisit that whole topic at some point because that is... It's interesting to, to consider what's really going on when a father is blessing their offspring. And there's more to it than our modern American thoughts really give account to. But anyway, let's get back, let's get back to this whole idea, this replacement theology. Where did it come from? You know, we've got, there's a, there was a, movement, British Israelism for a while, teaching that the ten lost tribes had migrated to Europe and then on to England and became ancestors of the British people. I think Herbert Armstrong had promoted that with the Worldwide Church of God. The black Hebrew Israelites claim that they are the true chosen people of God, but the, the question is why? Why do people want to make these claims that we are now part of the people that can claim these promises. They, they make a claim to equate these promises of God to Israel, to these modern people groups, because they want to identify with these promises, right? They want to identify. They want the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the Mormons think that the two tribes came to North America, and that's where the upper American Indians came. Right. Yep. Yep. So there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of history there. Now the fact of the matter is, Scripture is is somewhat silent on all of this. But we do know that you know Jews today don't identify by tribes. So there was some evidence of these distinctions as late as 200 A.D. But for the most part, the tribal delineations were were basically removed with that Roman conquest of Palestine. But one of the most miraculous events in history, I would say, is the, the preservation of the Jewish line down through the ages. When you look at all the people groups motivated by the enemy that have tried to extinguish that flame, all the way back to even before Esther, you know, the whole book of Esther talks about the, the attempted genocide of God's chosen people at that point. But the fact that they reappeared as a distinct people group in 
in the, the area of Palestine, 1900 years after not existing as a defined country. That's amazing. That's God. That's God. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> So we see, like, as God is, is keeping track of His people and His promises, when it appears that all's been lost, God says, don't worry about this. God's keeping track. Let's move on to verse 4 through the first part of verse 6. This is the call to repentance. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. But do not seek Bethel. Do not enter into Gilgal or cross over to Beersheba. For Gilgal shall surely go into exile, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live. So that's our, that's our overarching principle in today's class. Seek the Lord and live. Repentance is finally offered. We've been looking for it this whole book. The Lord just can't help himself to seek the Lord to return to him, but first we have to forsake whatever that thing was yeah. that we were chasing after. That's yeah. the, the first thing. When you, I think C.S. Lewis said it, when you realize you're on the wrong path, the fastest path to getting corrected is to turn around. <laughs> you got to forsake that which you were chasing after. So let's look at these places that they were, that they were, they were called to not seek after. Places of Idolatrous worship. We've seen some of these before. There are, there are places of idolatrous worship now, but there are also places of historical significance yeah. in the past. So let's talk about Bethel a little bit. Genesis 28, 11 through 19, that was the, the story of God meeting Jacob on the, the stairway to heaven. That happened in Bethel. Later, it was a place of returning to the Lord when God commanded Jacob to return to Bethel. Genesis 35, 1 through 7, he said, Put away the idols. We're coming back to God. We're going to build an altar. You had something, sister? Genesis 35, 1 through 7 was when God returned, when God basically brought revival to Jacob's household, but then Genesis 28, 11 through 19 was when God met Jacob on the stairway to heaven. So that all happened at Bethel, and then other things happened there as well. Gilgal was a similar place of importance in Joshua 5, 1 through 12. It was a place of return, a place of restoration. All the Israelites were circumcised. If you remember, they had stopped circumcising their children as they wandered in the wilderness and and that was a place where where there was a renewed commitment to the commands of the Lord a time of spiritual renewal said we're going to we're going to serve the Lord Beersheba was very important in Abraham's time that's where he made a covenant with Abimelech and later Isaac's altar the renewal of the covenant with Abimelech so these places were were very important. They, were, they had spiritual significance. And, and as we think about what is, the, what is the Lord saying here, He says, seek me and live. Don't seek Bethel. Don't, don't seek Gilgal. Don't seek Beersheba. All these places where, yes, wicked things are happening now, but also you, we can be tempted to seek the place where we had something spiritually significant happen. So the idea here is we don't first seek the place. We seek the Lord, right? Amen. We don't seek the place. It's good to have milestones, and that's why I'm, I'm hesitant to, to fuss too much about the place, because we all have milestones when we can look back on and remember, oh, remember when the Lord did this when we were at that, at that restaurant, or, or we, were, we were sitting in one of our children's rooms and something extremely important happened there. It's, that, that's good, but... It's not helpful if that's all you have left. All you have are these memories. If you remember Saul, we, we talked about Saul a little bit at the, the very first when we were setting the stage for Amos about how he consulted that medium of Endor because all he had left were memories of, of Samuel, right? He was living in Samuel's relationship with the Lord. So we don't want to live in someone else's past. We want to live in our current relationship with the Lord. So don't seek these places. Don't, seek, don't first seek 
these things. The Lord says, seek me and live. And that it's interesting because that's, that's our duty to seek God and live, but it's also our reward, right? We seek God and live. Everything you need. <laughs> Everything we need. Our duty and our reward. Seek me and live, God says. What you got? You know, I'm looking at that verse when he say, if you seek me, you will live. And he, first of all, the place we seek him don't give life. Mm -hmm. It's dead. There's no substance there. And he was telling them, you know, even in us, the, the things that we seek, that's no life. Mm -hmm. It's dead. So we have life. So why do you want to go seek something that can give you life? And I'm the only one can give you life. Mm -hmm. So when we start seeking those things where there's no life, we become, um, um, how would I say, not in tune no more. Right. And I say it like that. You know, we start seeking those things that don't have no substance, the things that cannot do nothing for us. Yeah. So that is why he telling Israel, and he tell us that they too. Don't seek at the things that go, you already have life. Because mm -hmm. we are saved. So why would you want to go and seek after something that's no life there? Yeah. Now it's not saying that the Lord doesn't have, you know, so for instance, um, Moses going up on the mountain. Why was that important? It wasn't the mountain. It wasn't this Tower of Babel kind of, I'm going to climb up and be closer to God. No, it was a special place because God was there. So we seek the place where God is. We, we actually talked about that a little bit at the, the men's retreat. If you want to get nearer to God, you take a step towards God. Take a step towards God. Be with Him. And where's, where's God promised to be? His Word. His body. So the things that you're doing this morning, that's taking a step towards the Lord because God has promised to be here. So we take a step towards where God is surely to be. Why are you leaving? Why are you leaving? It's just, it's getting better though. We had not even got to the doxology. I was saying... You know, God created the world and everything in it. And we go after the creature instead of creating. Mm. You know, he, he is the one that gives us the blessing. We go after the blessing and forget the blessing. How about that? You huh? know, and I said, Lord, help us. And we're going to talk, just so you know, we're getting to the Pleiades and Orion. <laughs> so just know we're going to be coming back to what you just brought up. Okay. So you are right. You are right. We, we, so we forget that creator, don't we? All right. Picking up in verse 6b, last part of 6. Lest he break out, we're going to read through 7. Lest he break out like a fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour with none to quench it for Bethel. O you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth. So this is the, the condemnation of injustice again. Our only hope is repentance, but if we don't, we'll receive this proper compensation for our sins. So this idea that God is going to break out like a fire, you know, fire is a devouring force, right? It makes things disappear. There's none to deliver, none to quench this fire. And we know that Deuteronomy tells us that God is a, a consuming fire, right? But this idea of justice to wormwood, if we remember wormwood was, we talked a little bit about that in our study of Revelation as well, but wormwood is this is a, the group of bitter plants. It's always in Scripture referred to or associated with bitterness and poison and death. And that was what we saw in, in Revelation. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died of the water because it had been made bitter. So the idea that Amos is dealing with here is that you know, proper justice brings contentment, but corrupted justice brings bitterness. Can I add something? 
you know, the Russian word for wormwood is Chernobyl. Oh, is it? Yeah, that was pretty Chernobyl. bitter, wasn't it? Interesting. Yeah. Russia, Chernobyl translates in English to wormwood. Yeah. <coughs> that's, pretty, that's a pretty bitter place, isn't it? <laughs> Even today, yeah. Even today, it's dangerous for Right, right. Yeah, the so yeah, that's a that's a good point. That's interesting. So the the remnant though, we're we're commanded here. We don't want to let any root of bitterness spring up. You know, regardless of the political or religious climate, you know, we're we're tempted to to pervert justice and we see that a little bit. Um, we're, we're going to come back to that concept in the second part of this. But we get to the doxology. This is the hymn of God's power. And when we talk about this, we see there are seven verbs of God's power. And the, you know, as we spoke in the past, seven is a, an important number for Amos. He, very often he groups things in groups of seven. So made, turns, darkens, calls, pours, makes, comes. So, so as we read this, think of, think of those. He who made, this is verse 8 and 9, He who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into the morning and darkens the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name, who makes destruction flash forth against the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress. So the, the idea in these two verses is just a reminder of who God is. The people no longer had a relationship with the Lord. They had to be reminded of what God had done. So, so Pleiades... I had forgotten what Pleiades was, and there I did it again. I went and cut off the... But Job refers to the Pleiades and Orion, and it's interesting. I, since I was looking at this, if you, if you go out, and some, some of us can see stars, but not many, but I, I walked out on a clear night, and sure enough, you can see Orion, and if you, if you extend Orion's belt straight up, you can see this little cluster. It doesn't nearly look that nice, but there's just a little cluster of stars, and that's the, the Pleiades, sometimes referred to as the Seven Sisters. Don't really know why. You know, I didn't, I didn't come across any reason why the Lord singled out Pleiades and Orion, other than, other than as an example of the glories that He has created. It's truly remarkable when you think about it. We talked, you know, in Psalms before about the the amazing fact of God's creation of the entire universe. What you got, Fernando? Uh, I just noticed Beetlejuice right there. There you go. When I was, <laughs> not everybody pronounces it Beetlejuice, but plenty of people do. And then, and Beetlejuice is one of the largest. I don't think it is the largest star. But it is one of the most. It's one of the most fascinating stars. When I was, uh, what's it been? A year or so ago, we were preaching in Psalms about the the glory of God, and and I did a little bit of poking into Betelgeuse. It's an amazing star. It definitely is. <laughs> it's a big one. So basically, we we're reminded that God created. And not only created, but He controls the universe. This darkness to light, day to night. He darkens that bright day of prosperity into the darkness of chastisement here. He's in charge of the oceans, the cycle of floods and rains. He, and that's coming from, from verse 8. Who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth. What do you think that's talking about? Calling from, for the waters of the sea... Pouring them out on the surface of the earth. What, what you think, baby? Rains were coming Rain. Down a few years ago. Rain. Yeah, like a hundred years ago, finally realized where the water was coming from. Yeah. He yeah, yeah, already ago. knew. Isn't that something? And you're talking about rivers in the sea. Yeah, currents in the sea. Yeah. Fresh water. Right. Miles down. Rivers. It's amazing, huh? How did how do they know all this? So we're going to take a quick little diversion, not too not too much, but in Job, do I have Job coming up here? I don't know if I have. I might not have Job, but that's all right. In Job five verse eight through ten, as for me, I would seek God, 
and to God would I commit my cause, who does great and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. He gives rain on the earth and sends waters on the fields. So if you were talking to somebody and you wanted to recount to them and remind them of the greatness of God, you'd say, he does, he does wonderful things, marvelous things, unsearchable things. Would you say, like rain? You know, maybe not. But John Piper wrote a, a devotional once, and we're not going to read the whole thing, but I thought it was good to read just a couple of paragraphs of it. He's talking about when we really sit back and think about rain. He calculated if an inch of rain fell on one square mile of farmland during the night, it would be over. It'd be 1.6 billion pounds of water. So he goes on, he says, that's heavy. So how does it get up into the sky and stay up there if it's so heavy? Well, it gets there by evaporation. Really? That's a nice word. What's it mean? It means that the water stops being water for a while so it can go up and not down. I see. Well, then how does it get down? Well, well, condensation happens. What's that? The water starts becoming water again by gathering around little bitty dust particles, and he, he, you know, it's basically ten thousandth of a centimeter wide. That's small. What about the salt? Salt? Yeah, the Mediterranean Sea is salt water. That would kill the crops. So what about the salt? Oh, well, the salt has to be taken out, of course. Oh, so the sky picks up a billion pounds of water from the sea, takes out the salt, carries the water, or whatever it is, when it's not water, for 300 miles, and then dumps it on the farm. Well, not exactly. It doesn't dump it. If it dumped a billion pounds of water on the farm, the wheat would be crushed. So the sky dribbles the billion pounds of water down in little drops. And they have to be big enough to fall for one mile or so without evaporating, but small enough to not crush the wheat stalks. How do all those microscopic specks of water that weigh a billion pounds get heavy enough to fall? Well, it's called coalescence. Well, what's that? Well, it means the specks of water start bumping into each other and join up to get bigger, so they fall. But if they would, but they have to fall so that they bounce off each other instead of joining up. And there's no electric field. It, it gets it, it gets complicated, doesn't it? And he ends by saying, I think instead I'll just take Job's word for it. I, he says, I still don't know how drops ever get to the ground, because if they start falling as soon as they're heavier than air, they'd be too small to not evaporate on the way down. So anyway, rain's pretty amazing stuff, is it not? It's an interesting way to look at it, what, what God has put into place that we just take for granted. Like rain. Rain. Oh, we fuss about, what, too much rain? Or didn't come when it should have come? <laughs> it's going to rain! Yeah, it's like, well, no, sometimes rain, oh, it's an inconvenience to me. I mean, my hair. What about my hair? <laughs> Case study in rain. So the same God, though, there it was. I knew I had it in there somewhere. The same God that creates such order can cause great destruction, right? He controls this rain. He calls for the waters of the sea, pours them out on the surface of the earth, and he gets to decide, right, whether it comes down at a billion pounds all at once or whether he has grace to dribble it out on us. So, so let's keep going. Condemnation of injustice, version 2.0. This is verse 10 through 13. They hate him who reproves in the gate. They abhor, abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, who turn aside the needy at the gate. Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Hatred of those who speak the truth. Hatred of those who speak the truth. We can't even call a man a man and a woman a woman today. Hatred of those who speak the truth. I was 
reading in my, my, my daily plan, I'm in Jeremiah these days, and I came across a, a passage in Jeremiah, Ask now and see, can a man bear a child? Well, it's a rhetorical question, because obviously Jeremiah says, knows that all the people that he's talking to are going to say, No, no, a man can't bear a child, but we're a little confused these days, aren't we? A little confused. A lot confused. <laughs> we are a lot confused. <laughs> And, you know, last week's sermon, we kind of dealt with enemies that are created that, are, that, that rise up because of things like this. When we speak the truth, then that truth is, is opposed. The oppression of the poor and needy, that's a recurring theme here in Amos, is it not? We're taking the money of the poor to build houses and vineyards. That's not pleasing to the Lord. He does not like when the rich become rich on the backs of of the poor. This is the same thing that Moses actually prophesied in our famous Deuteronomy 28. We always seem to come back to Deuteronomy 28 in this study. It says, You shall betroth a wife, but another man shall ravish her. You shall build a house, but you shall not dwell in it. You shall plant a vineyard, you shall not enjoy its fruit. So Moses prophesied this way back in Deuteronomy 28, and now Amos is saying that is going to happen. So remember one of God's, one of the main signs that God's hand is being removed from blessing a people is when our plans just don't work, the crops don't yield, we don't get the same benefit of our labor as we once did. And we see that, you know, with our, with our dollar these days, it just doesn't go as far as it once did. So here we see another grouping of seven sins. We're trampling, exacting, building, planting, afflicting, taking bribes, turning aside. A lot of, lot of examples here, but again, grouped in, in, in the number seven. And basically, there's, just, there's no justice to be found. You know, the, the gate in ancient times was the place of, of the courts. So imagine being in that society, and maybe this is not too far off, but where there's just no means for right. For wrong to be made right. You, you can't trust that when you go to the courts that you will be made whole. There's a bitterness in that lack of justice, right? There's a bitterness. But, but, but at the end it says, he who is prudent will keep silent. Those with insight are going to keep quiet. What's going on with this in verse 13? He who is prudent will keep silent in such a time for the, it's an evil time. Verse 10 started off by saying that truth speakers are hated. But is that a reason to not speak? Somebody turn to Jeremiah 20, verse 9. I don't think I have that. Jeremiah 20, verse 9. What does that say? If I say I will not remember him or speak any more in his name, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire. Shut them up at once. And I'm weary of holding it in and I cannot endure it. And Jeremiah said, I'm, I'm speaking it. There's truth to be told. People need to hear it. If we think about what happened to Jeremiah a few chapters after that, we had a false prophet named Hananiah. And Jeremiah had made himself a yoke, and he was wearing his yoke around. So he was a yoke, something that you would use to, to hook your oxen to the plow. And basically, Jeremiah's message was, you've got to come under the yoke of the Babylonians, and you're going to serve them for 70 years. And after that, things are going to look up, but just know, put your roots down, this is God's, this is God's decree. You're going to serve the Babylonians for 70 years. Hananiah comes along and says, no, no, no. In a couple years, Babylon's going to be gone. We're going to be good. And he, and he comes over and he takes the yoke and he breaks Jeremiah's yoke. He probably spent a long time making that thing. Breaks his yoke. What did Jeremiah do? That was, that was wrong of Hananiah. Hananiah was not speaking the truth. He was... Making the people believe a lie is actually what, how Jeremiah put it. You're making people believe a lie. But Jeremiah 28, 11, it says, But Jeremiah the prophet went his way. 
He didn't get all up in Hananiah's face right then. Now, he came back a little bit later and told, you know, Hananiah, you ought not to did what you did because you're going to die. And sure enough, he did die. But there's a time when words do no good. Jesus stood silent before Pilate, right? In both these instances, this, that's a dangerous time when the prudent are silent. Watch out. That is a dangerous time to be around when God says, you know what, don't even say. What's the definition of prudent? Prudent is... Prudent would be somebody, somebody that has that, the, the information, somebody that's got the, the, the truth. You know, that's the idea here, is that, that those who are pursuing the Lord, that are doing the right thing. But let's, let's, see, what the, let's, see, what, let's see what the actual definition... Prudent is wisdom? Yeah, those who have... I, th I thought there was something to do. I'm not looking for prudential. So that's like a wisdom. Yeah. Let's see what old Miriam says. Don't you hate it when they characterize by arising from or showing prudence? Okay, yeah. Tommy's going to keep on going there with that one. That's right. That's. Marked by wisdom or judiciousness. What's next, Tommy? And, and be there. And then marked by circumspection. So yeah, you it, it it would seem to be those that are that are the wise, those that have that that truth. That. Yep. So it arrived in the Middle English around the 14th century and traced. Well. Ooh. <laughs> It almost means like somebody is saying, just hold your peace. Yeah. You know, remember the Lord told Daniel, eh, you know, seal this one up. There are some things, and you know, I was studying about this, you know, actually in the wake of Lila's passing, I was, I was studying a little bit about how, you know, God is, God's nature and attributes haven't changed. Through, through times like this. And there's, there's part of God's nature that he, he is he's indescribable. We, we as finite beings can't fit God in our box. And it's just a, a natural, it's obvious, you can't take an infinite, an infinite thing and fit it in a finite space. So our finite minds will never be able to wrap themselves around God. And is that not good? It, you know, people sometimes want to figure God out. They want to be able to understand all there is to understand about God. But God in His wisdom says, I've revealed certain things to you. This is all you need to know. There's a whole lot of other stuff out there about me, about my nature. But you know these things. And maybe someday we'll know a little bit more. You know, we believe that to be true in glory when we're... We put off our, our fleshly natures and our desires and we're communing face to face with the Lord. Will we ever know all? Will we ever be able to comprehend all of the infinite God? We are still finite beings created to worship Him. But when God says, you know, that's enough. There's other things here that you just need to, to not worry about. Sometimes that's good. Actually, I would say all the time that's good because that's another aspect of God's nature and His attributes that remain unchanged. God is always good. He was good on Monday, and He was good Tuesday morning. He's always good, not, by, not because of what good things He's done for us, but because of who He is. He is good. He defines good, even when things like this happen. A call to repentance, version 2.0, 14, verse 14 and 15. Seek good and not evil that you may live, so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. As you have said, hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. 
So again, we see seven verbs of exhortation. But seek good, live, be with God. You know, we're told to hate evil, to love good. So basically, the idea of, of seeking good is, is seeking God. God is good. When we're seeking good, we are seeking God. We talked a little bit yesterday about the, the Christian hedgehog principle, which is this idea of, comes from a parable of the fox and the hedgehog, and I'm not going to go into great detail, but the fox is always trying all these elaborate schemes to get to the hedgehog. But all the hedgehog ever does is wrap up into a little ball with his points pointing out and frustrates the fox's plans. So the fox has to remember all these complicated things, and the hedgehog remembers one thing. And basically, we can boil Christianity down into the, the Christian hedgehog principle, love God and love people. That's the, that's the hedgehog principle of Christianity. Love God and love people. It's so simple. In fact, one of the, one of the, I can't, his name was Barth. I can't remember his first name. He was a European theologian. Yes. Somebody asked him, what's the most profound thing you've ever learned? And his answer, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And the student laughed. He was like, oh yeah, that's funny. And then the student realized, oh, he's serious. Jesus loves me, this I know. So it's, it's just amazing that, that we can spend so much time diving into this word and you can have books written on one verse but yet you can distill it down into this simple principle. Love God. Love people. The best thing a selfish person can do is to serve the needy. Because he says, what does he say? Seek, well, I've lost my place. Seek God that you may live. Seek God that you may live. Verse 14. So, the question would be, is it possible to seek God and die? Our church is mourning this morning for Lila. She did just that. She sought God and she died. Or did she? Could it also be said that Lila sought God and is now truly living? Because you know, we think of this, we think of death as this ultimate defeat. But that's the world speaking, right? The world has no hope after death. I have no idea what's going to go on after that. Romans 6, 7 through 10. For one who has died has been set free from sin. If we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also rise with Him. We know that Christ, having being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And again in 1 Corinthians 15, For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, death, where is your victory? This doesn't mean we don't grieve. Obviously, we grieve. But death's got nothing on us, right? We serve the Lord Jesus who conquered death and hell, put them to open shame by triumphing. So that seek God and live, even if you die. Seek God and live. It's a win-win proposition, right? There are many godly people that went into captivity. There are many godly people throughout history that have died. Crazy evil has happened to God's people at the hands of other, other people. But this earth isn't our home, right? But as we finish up here, just as that ray of hope is entering the scene, you know, there's no guarantees. Amos is saying, it may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious. 
And so we got to get back into our lamentation in verse 16 through 17. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, in all the squares there shall be wailing, in all the streets they shall say, Alas, alas. They shall call the farmers to mourning and to wailing those who are skilled in lamentation. In all the vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. That judgment that we're describing here is comprehensive. The comprehensive judgment in all the squares, in all the streets. But it's interesting that even in that, in, in verse 17, Scripture says, I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. One way or another, we are going to be with God. One way or another, we're going to be with God. We can seek Him and live, or reject Him and prepare to meet your God. That was what we talked about in, in Romans 4. Prepare to meet your God. So either way, we've got an appointment with the Most High, right? So today, again, we, we, we consider, what are we striving after? Is it God? If so, we're going to live. But if not, watch out. We talked about identifying our idols. I don't have to worry because I have fill in the blank. Or, or what's my heart running after? What's my idol? What am I, what am I seeking to, to put my trust in? You know, We're not all called to be pastors or missionaries. But in our going, no matter what we're doing, as we go, we are to seek God. And whatever we find ourselves doing, I pray that we would seek God in the midst of it. So so as we finish up today, be seeking in your going. That's That's the principle for our lesson today. Seek God and live. Whatever we're doing, seek God and live. Any comments? Thoughts? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word, Lord. We just pray that you would remind us of your greatness, Lord. We thank you for that brief moment of good news here in the middle of chapter 5, this doxology, this hymn of praise to you, Lord, where we can remember who you are, Father. We pray that, that for each one of us, Lord, we would seek you that that would be our habit, Lord, that that would define our lives, Lord, that yes, we would seek you in your word in the morning or whenever you've led us to commune with you, but also just throughout the day, Father, I pray that, that we would all be characterized as seekers of good and seekers of God. Help us to, to not chase after these shiny temporal things of the world, Lord. We just pray that we would understand the need to live our lives according to your design, that you may be glorified, Father, and in the process that we would see your goodness and experience your goodness. We thank you for your goodness, Lord. Lord, you are good. You are good. You will always be good, Lord. No one will ever be able to accuse you of being not good. We thank you, Lord, so much for calling us Lord, that we know we're servants of the Most High God. We praise you for that, Lord. And we give you glory. We lift our heads this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.